Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for having us. Um, before I move on to my talk per se, I just want to mention that uh, I'll give an overview of the marine biology-related work at the Marine Science Institute in this talk focusing on uh, organismal level and population level studies. But uh, that is to say, however, that we have other people working in ecosystem level studies, particularly in terms of coral reef, seagrass, mangrove ecosystems, as well as pelagic systems. So uh, what I will focus on are studies focused on reproductive bioecology and culture of reef invertebrates and seaweeds. Okay, so just to give you an overview, um, the, the scope of the work on culture and reproduction, which is both uh, the basic and the applied aspects, cover a lot of aspects. So it comes from the lab, from broodstock maintenance to settlement of juveniles, as well as the culture of the natural food and then the growing out, whether it's sea ranching, restocking, as well as value adding of the products. And this involves, in this particular case, you will see that we have to work a lot with different stakeholders, networking with the private sectors, local government units, and more importantly, we do a lot of biophysical and socioeconomic monitoring and evaluation. And that culture is also linked to stock assessment and improvement of fishery stocks. And thus, uh, we try to balance uh, and conserve genetic diversity of natural stocks. Okay, so let me start off with um, the first uh, organism that we started with this program. This is one of the, I guess, major programs based at the Bulina Marine Laboratory, and that is the giant clam uh, culture. This started over 30 years ago in, as part of an, a regional program. Um, to, uh, in relation to protecting species, because Stridacna gigas, which is the true giant clam, the one that grows to two meters, there are many other giant clams that are smaller, was already endangered in Indo-Pacific. So there was a program with Australia, Fiji, um, and Solomon Islands to rebuild these stocks. And in the past 30 years, MSI has continued the culture of this uh, important species and actually has restocked throughout the archipelago over in 45 areas, um, populations of this uh, endangered species. This um, species are now used in giant clam gardens that you find in a number of um, places in the country as tourist destinations. So we continue to do this work and culture. Uh, we're actually able to culture eight of the species, but this is what we focus on. So here's an ex a picture of the ocean nursery at the giant clam area. You have the highest concentration of cultured giant clams in one place in the Bolina Marine Lab. The last uh, survey, there were about 35,000 giant clams cultured from different species, of different species in that area. So make sure you come visit and see the giant clam uh, garden. Okay, so the other area, of course, are the corals. Many of our reefs are degraded, and so a lot of our work is into what we refer to as restoration ecology. And one of the animals that we culture are habitat-forming organisms like corals. The work on corals have also started in the past decade, uh, starting with reproductive studies, and has expanded in the past five years. Um, we have coral heads being brought to colonies to the laboratory during the spawning period. Uh, you have collection of the eggs and sperms, larval rearing, settlement, you know, in the hatchery as well as the ocean nursery, and then finally transplantation. Again, this is coupled with a lot of training and information dissemination. Um, this is being replicated in different places in the, uh, in the archipelago. So at the marine laboratory, we actually are some sort of an incubation area for culture and technology, and we have to spin it off and um, share with other parts of the country. We do a lot of our researchers traditionally have looked at uh, studies on a reproduction of selected reefs all over the country. Uh, fortunately, we have an archipelago with at least six marine biogeographic areas, so it's very important for us to understand different patterns of reproduction of the same species in different places. And by far, 
uh, have determined the timing of 37 coral reef species in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao over the years of study. So before the mass spawning was also, was only documented at the Great Barrier Reef, now with more observations and insight to observations, we are determining the exact timing of mass scales. And in the past two years, have finally documented the first real coral slick, you know. And this has um, opened the way for new and more innovative technologies, which is actually being piloted and innovated in the Philippines now. So from hatchery to growing them to, to areas, we're trying to bring them out earlier. So as soon as we have the larvae, they actually kept in this uh, ocean sort of intermediate nursery system and floating cages and seeded in degraded reefs. So this piloting work started about three years ago with a group of Dr. Villanueva, uh, with the Southern Cross University, Dr. Harrison, uh, who is a leading expert in this. And here is the first output. We already have some mature colonies from that initial uh, mass scale seeding at the Bolinao Marine. So this is showing that there is this opportunity. Now the downside of a sexual reproduction, the transplant is because you don't have a lot of genetic diversity. But with this method, you ensure that you enhance and maintain the genetic diversity of the populations. Okay. Because of this work and the culture, it also provides a lot of opportunities for us to look at uh, responses, ecophysiology. And here's an example where you we use the coral fragments, both the cultured from, uh, developed from asexual and asexual to determine and, and get them to a, a stress response. This is from the lab of Dr. Cecilia Conaco. And then look at transcriptomic analysis to see gene expression. This is a way to try to determine which trains of either zooxanthellae or the corals may be more resilient in case of temperature or uh, acidity. And so this model is being used or um, can be used with many of our cultured organisms to look at ecophysiological responses. Now I'll move on to my uh, favorite animals for now. Uh, I'm working with sea urchins and sea cucumbers, um, and, and for this presentation I'll focus on the Trypneustis gratilla and Holothuria scabra, which are very high-valued uh, invertebrates. I'm sure the Koreans love the uni, yeah? and also in terms of the sea cucumbers, the trepang, the dried product, and this is, as you know, one of the most high-valued uh, commodities in, in Asia. However, they're also very important organisms as far as the nearshore ecosystems. They are grazers, deposit feeders, very low in the, in the trophic chains, and so their role in seagrass and reef ecosystems are very important. Uh, the advantage is we've developed uh, technology for cultures for this species. Aside from culture technology uh, itself, my lab and my collaborators actually look at development of management systems. It's not important, it's not enough to develop the culture, but especially if you're going to pl outplant them, there has to be a management system uh, to make sure that you're doing sustainable restocking. So we have two models that have um, been shown, and this is the community-based grow out, where you have cages here, so our juveniles from the hatchery, the small ones are reared in cages, fed with sargassum. We had many studies on this to see what the best feed is, the best output. And the fishers grow them out for extra income. Okay, so this has been adapted. Um, what we're working on now also is a model of what we call a sea ranch. So here is you have a cage, but a sea ranch is an open area where the animals can be free ranging, but there is a, a management, it is a private uh, ex exclusive use rights for some people who are managing that area. And basically this is to also provide supplemental livelihood while rebuilding depleted stocks. Many of our invertebrate fisheries are already depleted, the populations, and the ones most affected of course are the smaller, smaller fishermen because the small fishermen cannot invest in commercial fishing, so they get a lot of income and livelihood from the near shore reef fisheries. So they are our primary target in our development of technologies and management. Um, so here's an example of what we do. For example, um, various students have looked at this. These are the gonad weight to bio weight. We looked at gonad production, quality, synchrony of reproduction. And this study showed that the animals being grown in cages 
actually synchronized the reproduction, very high gonad yield, and we know the timing, so this also facilitates the management of harvest. This technology is widely adopted now in northwestern Luzon when, where sea urchins are a local delicacy. So this is both uh, economic returns as well as the opportunity to produce juveniles with the spawning of the animals in the cages before they are harvested. Aside from culture, of course, we monitor the populations, the wild populations. So here's an example. Uh, we have quarterly or sometimes monthly. This just shows different sites in the Bolinao area, the different colors. And the red ones are the recruit of the year. These are the ones that are about one to three centimeters big. So we call them as the recruit of the year. And so we look at differences in the patterns of recruitment and strength of recruitment. And so you will see here, you have very variable interannual, and the strength of recruitment per year is very different within the year as well as between sites. So this is an opportunity for us to look at what are the broad scale and finer scale biophysical driving forces that determine recruitment you know, from the larvae and settlement. So this is an ongoing work that we looked at in terms of population dynamics. The sea cucumber Scomula sea ranch is a model that we developed where we have a five uh, hectare sea ranch where we release uh, juveniles and this is managed by an association of fishers with the idea of providing rebuilding stocks as well as providing access to small fishermen to culture these organisms. So we do monitoring we, of the stocks release. For example, here, these were the release stocks and you will see the immature subadult, and after about a year and a half, we have a very high density of established spawning populations. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to study the effects of typhoons, major typhoons in terms of populations of reef organisms. That you will see here a contraction of the population structure, and we have found uh, through the years uh, established. Uh, de facto, the sea ranch, is a reproductive reserve. The animals attain sexual maturity at about 180 to 200, and we have monthly mass spawning. So our sea ranch is effectively a reproductive reserve because if you harvest the animals when they're about 200 grams, they're too small and they're not export grade. So they're harvested when they're about 300, 320 grams, so you have a win-win situation. They have spawned before they are harvested, and when they're harvested, they get, get good economic returns from the fishers, and who we also train for improved. So here is an example of, of a marine reserve, reproductive reserve, and as a way of providing um, uh, sources of income. We also stain our um, juveniles at risk from the hatchery, because this is one of the biggest challenges of stock restoration, is measuring the impact. Right? And so we use fluorocomb dyes, that recycling, and we, every time we do a monitoring, all the animals that are less than 80 grams, we get a tissue, test the spicules to identify which ones were hatchery released and which ones were for the wild. And so here are some of the examples. So here's an example of the uh, epifluorescent microscope uh, frame. The ones that are lighting up are those that we the dyes, and those are animals that are stained. That means they came from our hatchery, we release them. Those that are not stained are wild recruits. So it is very interesting to find that the sea ranch also has a lot of recruits. And so the question is, does the high density of adult conspecific actually also enhance settlement, right? And at the same time, is the sea ranch a good source of larvae for other populations? And so some modeling studies are also being done together with students, uh, the laboratory of Dr. Villanoy. Um, aside from the culture, the other question is how do you make it accessible to the fishermen in many parts of the country? The hatchery phase previously took, at least from here, to release size would take at least six months. And so very expensive to run things in the hatchery. So we also looked at diversifying culture technologies that are low cost and adaptable by small fishers. And so we developed ocean floating HAPA system, so instead of rearing the post-settled ones, the very small ones, they're reared here, 
and or in a bottom set cage, depending on the climatic condition. In areas where the weather is rough, you don't want to use floating hapas, you can use the bottom set. So this is an adaptive uh, technology, it's diverse, that can be adapted to particular situations. They can also use advanced nursery in pens to grow out the animals bigger, because the bigger you release the animals, the higher the survival to maturity. And you can have different uh, modes of uh, grow out. And so one of the important things here is the socio-ecological systems. Different production systems allow participation of different stakeholders and multi-stakeholder partnerships. And so this is what we refer to as an adaptive integrated sandfish production system that is applicable to an archipelago like the Philippines. So here's an example in Palawan where we pilot tested this. This is a group of uh, IPs, indigenous peoples in that area. We gave them, we gave them spot and they grow them in the floating hapa. And these are their harvests, which they subsequently restocked in a protected area. So this is now being replicated in many places in the country. So just to give you an idea, the, the big picture at the national is to have different hatcheries in different biogeographic regions. And why is that? Because the population genetic studies um, of Dr. Ravago and the lab showed that the Philippine populations are very diverse. Each of these colors indicate distinct genetic stocks. And so we also want to ensure that we conserve the genetic stocks because this is the basis for resilience, especially to climate change. For example, this area here in Giwan is where Yolanda hit. This is a regularly disturbed by strong uh, uh, events and disturbances. And the genetic structure of the population is so different, so distinct. So they're probably locally adapted and so when they are locally adapted, we want to conserve locally adapted genes because they will also ensure that production is optimal for that site. So we're working with different uh, groups, state colleges and universities all over the country, private sector, to develop hatcheries and to be able to provide genetically distinct spot to fishers and growers to ensure that we maintain that and develop production clusters. Another organism, so that sandfish, Holothuria scabra, is the one that's been um, most developed in terms of the Indo-Pacific. It is now being cultured from Madagascar to Central uh, the Pacific. I'm sure in your areas, in the Micronesia, they also culture are interested in this. But we have, in the Philippines, over 100 species of sea cucumbers, 40, more than 40 species of which are commercially important. So scabra is just one of them. Now this is another species of interest, the Corpus horens, and this is the one that has that unique characteristic of uh, changing its uh, uh, cellular composition, uh, texture. And so my students are now studying in situ reproductive behavior of this. So we start with the biology. We know now that they spawn every month like clockwork, every three to four days after the, the, the quarter moon, the third quarter moon. Students also have looked at where are the juveniles. So here you will see that they use the seagrass and coral reef conversion, and they have fantastic camouflage and uh, adaptations for anti-predation. Okay. Coupled with this is trying to identify ecologically meaningful management units. This is a work of people in the lab of Dr. Villanoy to be able to identify using models on the biology and ecology of the species and simulating releases and, and settlement. And we identified here at least four genetic stocks that will be important for management. These are models of determining which are the best areas that provide supply. This is in Mindanao. And you will see this box here are the sites which are very good and provides a lot of stocks and which are the sink. So this uh, work is being done with Dr. Villanoy as well to look at connectivities on a broad scale and as a fine scale. Coupled with population genetics in the lab of Dr. Rachel Bravago, you will see that here in Davao, you have this population and this population is distinct from this. So this is important to guide restocking and culture efforts. Sorry. Okay, moving on. From the invertebrates, another major program for the Marine Science Institute is seaweeds. 
Um, the seaweed industry is our major dollar earner in terms of culture production for industry. And so the ongoing work here um, involves, and Dr. Azanza was previously with the macroalgae group as well, uh, just to give you an idea of sporlings, production of uh, seaweed seed stock for sporlings. From the hatchery, you grow them from spore cultures, different strains, and cut into for planting and outgrowing the nursery. Okay, so this is another strain from different parts of the country uh, that are grown and developed and identified in the hatchery, again, for seed out planting using floating HAPA. Okay, so here is a program, this is one of the major programs of the Department of Science, is to ensure that you provide the, uh, with quality stocks in different parts of the country. So just to wrap things up, uh, we've had to do culture-based resource management because our resources have been depleted and our habitats degraded. Uh, diversification, this provides opportunity for diversification and production of sustainable mariculture. However, it's very high risk and intensive. It has to be science-based and involves a lot of communities. And then the bigger challenge is scaling up to make a significant economic impact without compromising genetic conservation. Um, before I end, I just want to show a few other slides related to work by other people. Um, so the reefs are also being looked at as molecular resources, as Dr. Concepcion mentioned earlier. So here are some of the target organisms being looked at. Some of them are the ones that we actually culture. Dr. Cecilia Conaco, um, and this might be of interest to Dr. Lee, uh, students are interested in uh, genomics, uh, looking at uh, marine microorganisms, you know, metagenomics to identify microorganisms in the water columns, and of course, Rachel Ravago, uh, my longtime collaborator, has been looking at genetic connectivities of different commercially important species as well as reef associated organisms. And certainly, the connection with the Caruso has been one of the things that we have been looking forward to um, establishing. So, so maraming salamat, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-researchers in this program. Of course, Dr. Gomez, who started the Giant Clam Project, Dr. Edna Fortes, Patrick Cabaitan, Cecilia Conaco, and Rachel Gotanko, and uh, our funding agents from the Philippines as well as the Asia Australian Center for International Research in Agriculture. Thank you. Any questions? You presented a lot of uh, topics, so yes. we have a headache. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot the questions. <laughs> so, yeah. It was a nice talk, and then we learned many diverse organisms in, the, mm -hmm. in your country. Yes, the Philippines is the epicenter of uh, marine, marine biodiversity. biodiversity. Yes. yes. And I, won I was wondering, you did uh, sea urchin uh, reproduction and then also restoring the resources. In Korea, sea urchin is considered one of the culprits to def marine deforestation. Uh, how about in the uh, Philippines? Uh, which, which sea urchin species is that? In, it's a temporary species, Strongylus yeah. centrotus. Uh, uh, well, no, as you see, in the Philippines, it's harvested. It's a very high commercial value. This one is uh, one of the uh, highly valued sources of uni and preferred by actually the Japanese market and the Korean market. So this species is, is actually not a pest. It's, it's a very high value commodity. Yeah, personally, I don't think a sea urchin is the, the, the cul culprit for marine yeah. deforestation, even in Korea. But yeah. people uh, misunderstand, I think. Yeah, I think so, because they think they, they overgraze. But I, I think that's not really uh, the case, especially in the tropics. Okay, uh, 
let's move on to next talk. Thanks.